I am Heather Morton, and I work on financial services for NCSL, and I staff the Communications, Financial Services, and Interstate Commerce Committee. And I will be introducing our speakers with us for this afternoon's session. As a reminder to everyone, any recording of this session is prohibited unless previous approval has been granted by the NCSL Communications Division. And we definitely want this session to be interactive, an, an interactive discussion between our distinguished panelists and our audience. So we encourage you to answer quest or to ask questions. Um, when you have a question, we do ask that you step to the microphone and give your name and state and then state your question. Um, so that way everyone in the room and as well as online can hear your questions. To start off, uh, I'll just really fast uh, introduce all three speakers in a row and then I will turn it over to Rich who will start um, giving us an overview. And so Rich Eisen is our uh, is the managing editor and publisher of the StateNet Capital Journal, an online news publication that covers state level public policy trends across the 50 states. The journal is the editorial arm of StateNet, uh, a LexisNexis company, which has offices in Washington, D.C. and state capitals around the country. And Rich holds a Master of Arts degree in public and political communication from the California State University in Sacramento. Michael Hayes, our second gentleman, is the Senior Manager of Government Affairs at the Consumer Technology Association. He leads CTA's federal and state efforts on emerging, te excuse me, emerging technology issues, including artificial intelligence and the sharing economy. He is also responsible for leading federal policy initiatives related to patent litigation reform and high-skilled immigration. And then our third speaker is Oshande Ashaba, and he is an engineer at the RAND Corporation and a professor at the Party RAND Graduate School. His recent research focus has been on accountability in artificial intelligence and data privacy issues. Prior to joining RAND, he was a researcher at the University of Southern California, or USC, where he got his PhD in electrical engineering. And so if you want a fuller biographical information about the speakers that is available online or through the NCSL app. And so before I turn it over to Rich, I just wanted to quick pose a question to the, those of you in the audience by just by a quick show of hands to determine who is looking forward to artificial intelligence as a new and exciting area. Okay, good. Most of the room. And is anyone looking forward to it with trepidation? And again, most of everybody in the room. So, <laughs> perfect. So, Rich? Let's see if I can move this a little closer. All right. Well, that, that, that show of hands pretty much matches, I think, uh, what most people think about artificial intelligence. Because I think if there's one thing that's true about it, it's there's a seemingly endless supply of terms that we use to describe artificial intelligence or the process of uh, machines that are performing tasks that we normally associate with human intelligence. Uh, we used to just call that automation, which these days is kind of quaint and old school. Uh, nowadays we use terms like machine learning or we use deep learning, uh, but of course the one we're all the most familiar with is artificial intelligence. And while those terms are used interchangeably, they're all, all actually somewhat different things, which we're going to get into that in a little bit with our panel of experts. But suffice to say that this technology is already all around us. Google searches, for one. Uh, autonomous vehicles, most of us are familiar with uh, driverless vehicles. Smart home devices like Alexa and the whole Internet of Things where you can control your thermostat or your oven with your smartphone. Uh, online customer support. Uh, if you're not talking to an actual living human being on the phone, there's a very good chance you're talking or texting with a chat bot. Uh, even all of the smartphones that a lot of you are probably looking at right now, instead of looking at me, artificial intelligence, right? The list goes on and on and on, and you get it. So that said, there may not be anything out there today we collectively struggle to more to understand than artificial intelligence. and. Because of that, there's tremendous optimism. We saw that for what uh, the positive potential for artificial intelligence is, and also a lot of concern and trepidation over maybe what the negative uh, potential of that is, particularly on the U.S. workforce. Uh, just 
I know uh, about 12% of the U.S. workforce is in transportation. I mentioned autonomous vehicles. So if you are somebody who drives a vehicle for a living, I'm sure that your level of trepidation is pretty high compared to maybe somebody who doesn't do that. Um, and as the rise of this technology goes on, and the, this march toward uh, a semblance of AI ubiquity, uh, it's also, of course, drawn the interest of lawmakers and uh, regulators from around the country. Part of that has been spurred by people like, uh, you know, who, who are pushing that kind of concern. And this is not just, you know, your crazy bachelor uncle who's scared of the robots. Uh, we're talking folks like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking who have all urged lawmakers at all levels of government to take a really close look at the potential for artificial intelligence to do both good and bad. And so, uh, you know, some of that is maybe a push to have a much heavier hand on uh, regulation than they would on other things, maybe to, to slow this, what we think is probably inevitable transformation. So it's even spawned, quite honestly, a, a whole new field of law, artificial intelligence law, which deals, you know, primarily with rights and liabilities around the use of AI. Um, there's also a lot of uh, legislation deals with trying to foster or encourage investment into AI uh, technologies or sometimes to override state laws that would have an impact on that one way or the other. Uh, there's also things like data security. And, and even uh, certainly here in California, we have been talking at great length about the role that artificial intelligence is playing in, as an example, uh, the prison system and how it's used in terms of uh, s sentencing and uh, probation and bail issues. So, the social justice element is definitely a part of the AI discussion here. So with all of that in mind, I think we're very fortunate today to be joined by two people who really understand this technology, both its pros and its cons. And so they're going to each make a brief opening statement, uh, after which I'll be posing some questions. We're going to cover a lot of ground, but we will definitely leave some time for all of you to weigh in with some questions as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to, uh, first I'll, I'll just start to my immediate left with Michael Hayes. Thanks, Rich. Get this close enough. Um, I'll keep things real brief so that we can have a, a good back and forth discussion both with you all in the audience and with the panelists up here. Uh, I'm Michael Hayes with the Consumer Technology Association. Uh, we're the trade association that represents the consumer technology industry. That is a $351 billion industry here in the U.S. We represent over 2,000 companies, uh, and that supports about 15 million U.S. jobs. Some of that is in artificial intelligence. We represent many of the leading companies in this space. Uh, and because of all of the attention in industry, in society, and in government around artificial intelligence, we launched our artificial intelligence working group at the beginning of this year to start tackling some of the big questions around AI. How can we put forth prudent policy on AI, make sure we can take advantage of the benefits that it's poised to bring, but also answer some real questions that people have about how it will impact their lives and potentially, as Rich mentioned, their jobs. You know, it's no secret, title of this panel, AI is here. I think, unfortunately, we often think about it as something that is hypothetical, that it's out there in the future, and that one day around the corner it will suddenly show up and revolutionize our lives. Right? That is happening. We are living it right now, as Rich mentioned. Healthcare, patient data is being analyzed in real time and being fed to doctors to be able to make more informed, better, and in oftentimes lower cost decisions that are then improving health outcomes. Cybersecurity, very complex attacks on systems are being mitigated by deep learning and artificial intelligence systems that can detect patterns that would indicate that there's a potential threat and in some cases mitigate that threat immediately or in other cases alert humans as to how to best mitigate that threat. We experience this voice assistance, driver assist technologies. You experience it every day when you get um, warnings from your bank of potential fraud on credit cards. That's often an artificial intelligence system that's making that alert. As it becomes more and more ubiquitous in our daily lives, able to take on more complex tasks, AI is going to raise more complex questions. And that's okay. We need to confront those questions. 
we see them falling into three main buckets, jobs, bias, and security. And hopefully today on this panel, we'll be able to get into how, as industry and government, we can help address those questions, and in particular, what states' roles are to help address some of those questions. But I don't want this all to be about addressing questions and uh, alleviating concerns. AI represents an enormous potential boon for society uh, and for our economy. Right? We need to talk about how states can poise themselves to be the ones to take advantage of this. We hear about how the US government is positioning themselves. We hear about how China, how France are putting themselves out there as AI leaders, whether in actual economy or in thought. It's not the exclusive domain of superpowers, right? Your state can compete in that. You have universities, many of you world-class universities, that house many of the leaders in foundational research that is driving artificial intelligence and other computer systems. You have community colleges that are partnering with industry right now to create dynamic curriculums that are focused on making sure that graduates have a pipeline to a good paying job in the technology space. These are things that the federal government can't facilitate, and you can. So I want the takeaway from this to be, there are some concerns about AI, and we collectively can help address them, and there are some enormous benefits from AI, billions of dollars in economic benefit, many societal benefits for health, wellness, quality of life. Your state can be at the forefront of bringing those to your communities, and I hope we can get into how exactly we can help make that happen. Great, I'm going to turn this over to Ashonda. Ashoba. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to repeat many of the things that have already been said. Um, the primary theme being the dual use aspect of artificial intelligence, or any technology for that matter. Uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, talk about technology, it's possible to use it for awesome, wonderful things. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, so, dual use of artificial intelligence or any technology. Artificial intelligence promises to revolutionize the way we live in our day-to-day -day lives. It already is part of our lives. It's, um, it's, it's ubiquitous, as we already mentioned. Uh, but I am an engineer at a policy think tank. We focus mostly on the use of our, on institutional aspects of the use of technology. Um, it's one of the portfolios we have, we have a whole bunch of other portfolios. I personally tend to focus on technology in institutions. But if you think about the ubiquity of artificial intelligence for a second, think about how you got here today. The maps you used when you said, okay, I was trying to get to LACC, the LA Convention Center. You told a piece of technology that, oh, this is what I want to do, and it allowed, it gave you a path from where you were to where you are now. In that sense, uh, that's the same thing with most of the use of artificial intelligence. It's basically a way to improve our impact on the world, to a way to achieve goals in the world. And so we often have this question of what exactly is artificial intelligence. Uh, I take a more expansive definition. I don't really care whether it's machine learning, deep learning, expert systems, or anything like that. It's, it's basically any piece of technology that enables us to achieve computational goals in the world. This is Mark Carthy's definition. And for the most part, it includes things like searching for solutions, recognizing patterns, learning new things in the world, or just planning how to get from A to B. And so taking that point of view, um, I, I start thinking, OK, how, where, where is artificial intelligence being used? Uh, we start thinking about things like uh, the filter bubbles. That's how AI currently affects personal lives every day. We're thinking about, OK, I want to see, a, I want to read news on the, on the internet. Well, that's going to be mediated and co directed by artificial intelligence systems. But that's a personal commercial part of the, of the, of the story. I focus mostly on things like um, institutions like the criminal justice system, institutions like insurance, institutions like um, DHS. How do they use artificial intelligence? What are the problems that may, that may rise up in the use of artificial intelligence? And so one of the things we found there, the, the, the types of questions that come up tend to be of three, three types following the same, the same pattern here. It's usually either questions of equity. I use the word equity as a positive spin on this idea of bias, because most of the time we talk about machine learning, we talk about bias in machine learning. Or it comes up as um, the privacy concern that, that behind many of the artificial intelligence deployments we have today. And the third thing that we'll talk about quite a bit today is the future of work. How does automation by artificial intelligence lead to changes in labor markets? But first of all, the equity point. 
So recently, the Harvard Business Review had this piece by this researcher saying, well, artificial intelligence, if you want, if you want better systems, if you want fairer societies, you just use more algorithms. Mm -hmm. And the point he was trying to make there was algorithms are necessarily, or at least usually, better than humans making decisions. And that's almost always true, at least in the places where we deploy them. But that kind of sort of doesn't account for the different ways in which algorithms are being used. One of the things about algorithms is we use them. I use algorithms and AI interchangeably. We use them without knowing that we're using them. And we're not necessarily clear about all the ways these algorithms are causing errors. We have this thing called automation bias. When errors happen, because they are, done, they are caused by artificial intelligence and it's behind this black box, we don't interrogate them. Compare that to how we address errors in human institutions. When a human makes an error, we're able to ask them for reasons why they made, they made the errors. So just saying that AI is, is better than humans at making, at making decisions is not the full picture. We have to be able to talk about what happens when inevitably they make errors, because it's essentially a fundamental law of computation, where if you're making decisions in finite time with finite data, you're going to be making errors at some maybe small rate, but you're inevitably going to make errors. So how do we control for that? So that's part of the question. But there's also this issue of who, who bears the burden of artificial intelligence errors? When AI makes mistakes, does it make mistakes equally across, across society? And increasingly, we find that that's not true. Um, the recent examples would be facial recognition technologies. We are seeing that um, because of the way they are trained, data on which they are trained, you have AI systems that are very good at identifying and recognizing certain types of faces, but have almost three to 10 times the error rate on a different part of society. Imagine how, how, what happens when these types of technologies are being deployed ubiquitously. Imagine if it becomes a, a routine part of a surveillance apparatus. Who bears the burdens of every mistake these types of closed box systems make? And the, third, the, the, the second part, the issue of privacy. Current, the current generation of artificial intelligence is what we call machine learning, basically statistical machine learning. It's basically your basic statistics amped up on steroids. It relies on data. Who provides that data? It's every single one of you in your use of artificial intelligence, your use of Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, every single device you use, every single commercial entity you use is probably collecting data on you. And they're using that data to learn to become more intelligent in making decisions. But then what happens when um, that those treasure troves of data get broken into. What happens when somebody breaks in and takes that data? Who bears the brunt, the burden of those breaches? At the moment, for the most part, it's the user. At some point, we're probably going to have to revisit that problem, that, that issue. Um, EU's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is trying to address this. Hopefully, we can get some version of an address in the United States. And the last point is this issue of the future of work. How does artificial intelligence change the labor market? Um, I, I guess I'm of two minds on this one. The implication of technology for, for, for the labor market is not a new concern. It's a really old concern. Every time we have a new wave of, of, of technology, we worry about whether we're going to lose jobs. And historically, that's not been true. But then you can argue that artificial intelligence is sufficiently different that the, the disruption due to AI is going to be so disruptive that it's going to destroy society. I'm not going to take that extreme of a view. I'm going to cut the middle somewhere and say there's going to be job churns. What happens when um, automation renders a skill less valuable? What happens to people who have spent their entire lives developing that skill? So I'm thinking more like uh, people like radiologists. What happens to those types of people? And, but then there's the flip side of that. What happens when AI becomes so ubiquitous that it allows for new types of work to, up, to appear? Think about the gig economy. Gig platforms exist largely because you have algorithms enabling the flexible, the flex, flexible allocation of demand to supply using artificial intelligence. So I, I guess I, I'm, trying to ho I'm hoping that people take away the point that AI is going to have a disruptive effect on, on labor, but it's not always negative. And we have to figure out a way to regulate, legislate in such a way that we sustain and account for the welfare of humans while reaping the benefits of artificial intelligence. Great, well thank you both for uh, those statements. Uh, a lot to chew on, uh, good and bad, <laughs> a lot to chew on. 
I, but I want to, of course, go back to the workforce thing. Let's start there because I think that's uh, the greatest area of concern, and particularly for lawmakers because it really uh, gets into uh, retraining and workforce development, uh, education. I mean, that touches a lot of areas that are uh, very important to most lawmakers. I, you know, there's a wide kind of disparity in, in how people see the impact of AI and how fast all of that will happen. But I think everyone agrees it is going to change the workforce, okay? So then the question becomes, how prepared are we right now for this inevitable transformation? Are we 50% ready, 75% ready? I mean, I don't know if you can quantify anything like that, but when you, when you kind of see what, what we're capable of and what we're actually doing, how prepared do you see us being for this inevitable transformation uh, in technology? Yeah, I don't think that we're adequately prepared. I'm not going to attempt to quantify it with yeah. a number. Um, but look, we just hired our first vice president of US jobs um, to focus largely on these issues, right? We represent an industry that creates very transformative technologies, not just artificial intelligence. That means an extraordinary number of new opportunities for people in the United States and globally. It also means an extraordinary amount of change for people in the workforce globally. We as an industry, as the ones creating this technology, believe that we have an obligation to be part of the solution to that. And that falls in two categories, we think, right? You need to look future focused. How do we make sure that future generations are able to take advantage of the new opportunities that technology creates? How are we making sure that not just higher ed, like I mentioned earlier, but K through 12 has exposure to computer coding, to robotics, partially to learn the technical skills but partially so that we have kids who are in traditionally thought of as disadvantaged areas who might just not think that a career in technology is for them, right? They might not be exposed to this and think that that's something that's attainable. And so we as an industry need to work with you all uh, to make sure that local schools, that local education institutions, others that work in the education space are exposing people at a young age to the fact that there are going to be opportunities created by technology. That's beneficial for your communities, and it's beneficial for our companies who have labor force in many parts of the country, not just your traditional tech hubs as we think of them. The second piece of that, and that's challenging, right? I don't mean to just flippantly say we can do this, okay. um, but that I think is somewhat less complex than what we do about the near-term disruption that I think is what we often focus on in uh, newspaper articles and you know, other press is that we're going to have people who have developed a certain skill uh -huh. who will then need to reskill to some extent in order to have future opportunities. We have an obligation to help those people. It's going to take a lot of different partnerships with you all to meet whatever needs are local, right? Every state has different industries. AI is not going to show up tomorrow and disrupt them all. It's going to happen on a sliding scale. There will be some people that will need assistance in a few years. There are going to be some people that might need assistance in 10 years. And it's going to be important to have one-off efforts or replicable efforts if there are more countrywide scenarios that can help land those people in a relevant new job. But that's going to fall on a lot of you all. That's not the federal government that's going to step in and have a nationwide jobs program. It's going to be our industry working with local and state legislators to solve local problems and make sure that there is a fair solution and a fair path forward for these people whose job might be changed by AI or other technology. Hmm. I, I, I totally agree. Well, almost totally. <laughs> there's, the, there's the issue of, yes, we need to um, Education is one of the, the, the levers for addressing the future of work problem. That's always going to be the case. Uh, but I, I think back to when the, the car, the advent of the car in, in society, and think about, OK, did we want to teach people back then to become drivers? Do we want more drivers? It's not, that's not exactly the point. So when, I, when people tell me, well, train people to use computers more, I, I'm, not necessarily, I'm not necessarily sure that the, that type of prescriptive advice is the way forward. But there has to be a change in the way we do education. There has to be a, way, a change in the way we, 
we equip people with skills to, to address the, new, the future job market. One of the things that comes up a lot in conversations about the future of work, when you ask for, for a number, that, that's like a bear trap right there. I'm not touching that. Like we've, we've, we've had people writing people saying 9% of jobs are at risk, others saying for the 7% of jobs. I'm not touching that, that's, that's not, most, most likely those numbers are not accurate and they don't really help us. But one of the things that comes up is people try to think about what is the job of the future? Besides trying to be, what, what are the characteristics of the, of the job of the future? And people have thought, well, you need some, in general, jobs that are robust to, to automation tend to be uh, cognitively, you know, cognitively, cognitively heavy and non-routine. Another way of thinking about it, you, you tend to need something that involves social manipulation, social, uh, social interaction, some version of creativity. And it's weird, this idea of fine perceptual manipulation seems to come up over and over again. So what that leads me to think is, when we think about the jobs of the future, reskilling for, for the new labor market, it's more about being flexible, being creative, and less about saying, okay, go into this particular career path. Because eventually, we already see this now, people don't last more than four or five years in single careers anymore. We need people to be more, more flexible at switching between jobs, at using different skills. And what that means also is, well, that's, that's more of an individual approach. But from our, from our regulatory, from a government approach, there's this question of how do you support people whose careers are going to be more fractured over time? We have to worry about what does a safety net, what does a safety net that, benefit, that, that safeguards the welfare of workers look like? I agree with you in the sense that it's probably not going to be a federal solution where we have this federal safety net for everybody that makes sure everybody's okay. But we need to think creatively about how this is going to turn out. I don't know what that's going to be like. Yeah, and one thing to, to add there, and certainly agree on the notion that we're not just going to make everyone coders and they're going to be fine for life, right? We're in a much more dynamic labor force. And I think that both people and education institutions and yep. legislators need to think about what does a lifelong learning model look like, right? We talk about lifelong learning right now and just tend to kind of throw it on top of the existing education model that we have. Mm. It's just sort of on you, worker, to think about what you want lifelong learning to look like for your career. It may help as legislators to start thinking about how do your local institutions meet those needs and encourage those needs of lifelong learning so that when we have the next technological revolution that's beyond artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. whatever that might be, we don't sit up here and talk about how are we going to have to suddenly intervene to help people that are displaced by the next technological revolution. Hopefully, societally, we will have thought about ingraining that in our education model so we don't have so many questions about how that will play out in the labor force. I think the summary there is welfare, not jobs. And I don't mean welfare in the typical government sense, the well-being of workers as opposed to just jobs. Well, that, that, okay, so this makes me rethink what I was going to ask you because, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask is, you know, maybe, because you mentioned a couple different times how this is really going to come down to uh, working with lawmakers and lawmakers needing to uh, think about this and, and take action. So my thought then becomes, uh, you know, particular areas where maybe legislation should be focused. Uh, we've talked about education. We've talked about re-educating uh, maybe older workers in particular. I don't want to use the term re-education, by the <laughs> way. But. That was a really poor choice of words. Uh, um, offering new skill sets to uh, older workers. Let me try that one here. Uh, but. Maybe another element in all of this is educating lawmakers as much as we're educating, you know, students in school about how these systems work and uh, maybe where they're going. And I ask that not as a detriment, of course, to anybody in, in, in elected office, but, you know, things tend and technology moves super fast. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything anybody that's elected can tell you, things don't move super fast in state houses. So mm -hmm. how, where, where would you suggest the emphasis be put in terms of uh, helping lawmakers get a handle on these things that we're talking about. So 
this is what I spend a lot of my life doing, uh, mostly at the federal level, because uh, our, our bread and butter is at the federal level on these issues. That's not to diminish everything that you guys are doing. It just speaks to where I've been spending the past 10 years. Um, but we have been making a concerted effort to develop new leaders in artificial intelligence at a federal level. That means we've been organizing small roundtable events. We've been organizing briefing events for both staff and particularly younger members of Congress who really have an interest in being future leaders on these issues. Uh, that's an effort that I think uh, certainly there would be merit to attempting to replicate in state houses. Uh, it would be a heavy lift because of the number of state houses and the number of potential great leaders that we could have out there. Uh, I don't want us to shy away from it, though, and I think that it would be a good thing to try to tackle. Uh, so, so this, yeah, this comes up quite a bit. How do you best optimally inform legislators to be able to regulate technology in a useful way. Uh, it's useful, what, one, one thing that I found is that there, there are two types of skills, especially working artificial intelligence. Knowing the technology is one thing, but knowing how policy is affected by the technology is a different skill set entirely. Um, it's, it's rare to find that in one person. And I don't think it's maybe I don't think it's maybe the best idea to try to push that into one head. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I think it's important that legislators are advised by very well, very well trained people on the technology for which they're about to regulate. I don't I wouldn't expect them to know all the nuances of deep learning or artificial intelligence or anything like that. But having access to smart people, really smart people, is the way to go. I think. And you have a lot of these smart people often in your communities at your education institutions, right? Yep. You have researchers at your universities. And rather than wait for an outside organization to come in and set up a robust educational effort, which would be wonderful if we could facilitate that, uh, there are opportunities to reach out in your community to people that are going to have important knowledge about this stuff. Sit mm -hmm. down for an hour or two, have them brief you and your staff. Uh, and start learning a little bit about what's happening at those institutions, what they're training students for, uh, and how you might think about uh, aiding those efforts or learning from those efforts. Uh, Shonda, you brought up algorithms. Hmm. And I think that's a really key thing here to, to take a look at because basically, I mean, how do we mitigate against the human fallibility of, you know, the of what goes into creating algorithms. I mean, we're basically talking about teaching machines to do things that require use of require human intelligence. But you know, if we're talking about you know making the machine capable of doing that, we're we're still talking about human input. Mm -hmm. How is it even possible to mitigate against that? And and what are maybe the ramifications of not getting a handle on that? Oh, uh, the ramifications are dire. Terminator style, that, no, not quite that far. <laughs> um, so this, this comes up a lot. How do you create an artificial agent that's not, that's able to control for its, for its fallibility? And I always try to look back to how we deal with humans. Humans are very intelligent and we figured out a way to have institutions that control for the mistakes we make individually. And so we do this by systems of accountability. We do this by oversight. We do this by, by, by careful certification. Same thing happens with algorithms. You train an algorithm, and if it's making a decision in a high-risk, high-stakes domain, it's somewhat irresponsible to have it just go do its job without oversight, without some version of verification, validation, and safety checks. We do this with everybody, everybody who has a responsibility. Why would we expect any different with artificial intelligence systems? Um, the difference here with, with algorithms, with machine learning systems, is um, getting an algorithm to explain to you why it made a particular choice is, um, is, has been tough. You, he, you hear this thing we call the black box problem, basically saying you give an, an algorithm an input and you, it gives you an output, and you're trying to understand why it gave you that output. It's not quite clear how to do that, and much of the research in the past two years has been focused on trying to make these algorithms more explainable and more, more, more interpretable. Um, there is good work, but it's still, there's still miles to go on this. Yeah, I think everything that you raised is very important. I want to add a very non-technological um, piece to this that would be of assistance as well, and it's a very important thing to Consumer Technology Association. 
um, which is the diversity of the technology workforce, mm. right? There's still a lot of room to improve, and that's something that we're very upfront about and open yep. about, and we want to be part of the solution for. Yep. If you don't have a diverse workforce, there is a much greater chance that you are going to have an algorithm that does not reflect the society that it is then being deployed on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is not just a matter of taking advantage of all of the talent that we have in the United States, which is a good case for diversity on its own. Mm -hmm. It's also about making more diverse technology, which is less likely to be biased in some of the ways that we talk about creating bias outcomes. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I add one more point? You sure can. Uh, so uh, I, let's, I guess I, it's useful to point to concrete, concrete examples of ways to try to address um, bias in these types of technologies. Um, my, my friend and colleague, researcher, Tindal Gebru at Microsoft Research has this paper on uh, creating data sheets for, for, uh, for data that goes into training algorithms. Because as you said, most of, a lot of the biases, a lot of the inequities that that we see in algorithmic systems come from the inequities in the, uh, in the original training data set. So she has the idea of trying to audit the data to be more representative, to be less biased. And uh, um, AI now in New York also has this idea of an algorithmic impact, impact assessment. The same way we have an environmental impact assessment or a privacy impact assessment. If you are going to deploy an algorithm, probably in a public space, you, it's up to the designer and deployer of the algorithm to check how that algorithm affects different parts of society to check for all sorts of um, safety problems, all sorts of bias problems, and have that in a, in a concrete, consistent document. Well, okay. so along those lines, I think, you know, we have seen a lot of concern of late that some systems uh, that are in use, I mentioned earlier, you know, here in California in particular, are inherently biased against people of color. If that is the concern, and we don't yet have the, fu the, the full handle maybe on how algorithms are used, would you then recommend to lawmakers to pump the brakes a little bit on using these systems in some of those areas where it could have a very detrimental effect on some populations? Or, or is that a little more extreme than what you know, we're talking about here? It, it's a difficult. It's a difficult suggestion to tell either people in the commercial space or in the public space not to not to. De well, that's not true. It's asking somebody not to deploy technology is a harder sell than asking them to be more careful, be more cognizant, be more understanding of all the ways that technology can go wrong. So one of the things we try to do is give people who are thinking of deploying a artificial intelligence or basically any other form of tech, give them a workflow for thinking through how things might go wrong. Make sure every time they deploy something, they're thinking through these problems. And when there is peer-reviewed evidence that the technology is biased in some way, shape, or form, then they have a good reason not to deploy that or at least figure out a workaround that tries to, um, that tries to address those inequities. Um, so far, the, the literature is going very quickly, but it hasn't quite gotten to the point where we can robustly say AI systems are beyond bias. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And there is also this added question of, um, so think about the Compass, the Compass example from two years ago. So a couple years back, ProPublica released this report showing that a Compass algorithm for recidivism estimation was biased in, in interesting ways. And the, the company that made the algorithm shot back saying that, actually, no, we are not biased. And if you look at the conversation between them, they were talking about bias in two different ways. And those different ways of talking about bias or equity, they, they have arguments for them. How, who gets to choose what standard of equity guides a particular algorithm? That is a difficult question, and we don't have answers to that yet. And as long as we don't have answers to that, we still need to think carefully about things. Yeah, I think it's important that we look, when we're talking about bias, the most important thing is to look at biased outcomes, right? Is the algorithm producing a biased outcome? When you all have the implementation of an algorithm, let's say in a criminal justice setting, that's someone's life on the line. And if there's concern about a biased outcome in that, you should be rightfully concerned about the use of the technology in that space. And you may want to delve into whether or not it is the best use of this technology at this time. Um, I'm not speaking to an individual situation, but it is a 
area in which I would urge caution. There's a lot of really exciting areas in artificial intelligence uh, where we can deploy the technology to make people's lives better. There are still questions as to whether there are biased outcomes, and you, uh, an instance was mentioned where you know, it, it certainly seems like a biased outcome. You all, in your oversight of your justice system, should be taking a close look at that. So those are some negatives. Let me ask about a positive. I hope it's a positive. Uh, cybersecurity. I think every state is concerned, every state lawmaker is certainly concerned with you know, improving data security, improving, uh, preventing hacks and all kinds of things. Um, tell me a little bit about how AI is being used in the cybersecurity space. You're probably better than me technically on this. Um, I am aware of uh, I don't want to name check a company. I'm aware of at least one company that's deploying deep learning to try to identify signatures for viruses. By signatures, I mean very broadly, understanding what a malware looks like and trying to deploy, use that type of signature in the wild to identify either old viruses or new viruses. And they're, they're showing really, really good, really, really good performance. In general, when we think about artificial intelligence, at least deep learning. It's about pattern recognition. That's its main strength. And if you think about virus detection, cybersecurity, it's really, most of it is about pattern recognition, recognizing what malware looks like, either in terms of its code base or in terms of its behavior. And once you're able to recognize those patterns, that helps you improve your virus, your antivirus outcomes. Yeah. But I, I don't know if you have. Yeah. No, I mean, it, uh, you highlighted the important stuff is that we're at a point right now that this technology can often behave better than a human in this instance, right? This is a sweet spot for AI technology. It's a very data heavy, computationally heavy, and pattern heavy area. Those aren't things that the human mind tends to be excellent at, and they are things that our current iteration of artificial intelligence technology happens to be really good at. Um, so we have a number of companies, both in the technology side um, in the software side and in the hardware side, you're particularly uh, creating GPUs, mm -hmm. where you have the computing power now to be able to scan all of these potential scenarios of a virus hack incoming and mitigate that far quicker than a human ever would be able to. Well, I, I will point out, I know you wanted to go positive, but I'll, I'll go <laughs> negative again. I, I will point out that uh, Intelligence is relative to background context, background intelligence levels. So far, antivirus, cybersecurity has been trying to thwart a uh, uh, human adversary. Artificial intelligence is dual use. You can use it to defend, but you can also use it to attack. So uh, it, we can imagine a future in which um, the use of artificial intelligence enables better, more sophisticated cyber attacks. We already had one example almost five years ago, where there was a very targeted malware that was trying to achieve an aim, and it used very rudiment, basically rudimentary intelligence to achieve that specific aim. Imagine that multiplied by 10. That gets much, much worse. So you can imagine nation state actors vying against each other with artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence enhanced malwares to achieve strategic aims. Well, so I mentioned uh, autonomous vehicles which, you know, in, in recent years, we've seen states really competing, and cities really competing to get uh, autonomous vehicles uh, legalized to be tested on their, on their roads, right? Certainly here in California, we've seen it in Pennsylvania and Arizona. Uh, of course, also, we saw a very unfortunate, uh, actually a few very unfortunate accidents uh, related to autonomous vehicles in recent years. And I think it scares people to some extent that whether it's a, a vehicle or a drone, uh, these things being hacked and weaponized, being used, uh, you know, so an act of terrorism or just yeah. what have you. Um, how realistic, number one, are those fears? And number two, how, uh, what tools are, are there to be able to mitigate against this? So this cuts across not just autonomous vehicle and drone technology, but as an industry, if you don't have robust security protocols mm -hmm. and your device, whatever it is, can be hacked to the detriment of the user or society, that is a terrible business model, right? It, like, it's in our best interest to make sure that these things have robust security built in. So that's something, just blanket, we're, we're committed to when you're talking about drones and autonomous vehicles. Um, certainly, um, the stakes are, are quite high given the, the nature of those 
entities, um, all the more important to make sure that we have the right security protocols in place. Because if done right, these technologies could have extraordinary benefits, right? Think about how bad people are at driving, right? Your average uh, person out there on the road, if you're going to get into an accident, typically caused by human error. It's not going to be a natural fluke. That's something if self-driving technology is deployed and deployed right, you know, we could theoretically mitigate most human-caused accidents with this technology. Mm -hmm. So that's something really to look forward to. That's an enormous benefit that we could have. Um, it means that we need leaders like you know, California, like Arizona, like other places that are allowing for the testing of this technology to make sure that we get it right um, so that when it's deployed finally, it is done right, it's done safely, and of course builds in those security protocols that we mentioned. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, security is always going to be a, a, key, a key problem. Uh, one of the things my colleagues found is even when we are, we are able to provably show, or at least convince people that tech is safe enough, safer than humans, there is this perception problem that still plays into regulation, and it's really path dependent. Think about GMOs in, in, the, in the EU versus GMOs here. Uh, think about nukes in Germany, nuclear, nuclear power in Germany versus nuclear power here. And the same thing with autonomous vehicles. If, if the public discourse is different, even if it's safer, it still might not get as much traction. Oh, yeah. It still might not get as, get as much traction. But again, on the negative side, <laughs> uh, security is always an adversarial game. Uh, so even if, you, you're, even if you, you're able to safeguard, s secure a system for the current setup, eventually an adversary will, will learn to overcome that. So I think legislation, regulation should not be focusing on the current level of technology. It should be focusing on how to um, blunt that adversarial game. I don't know how to do it yet, but that seems to be the way to go. Well, speaking of that, so, so much of what we're talking about is what, uh, you guys know these terms better than I do, but uh, the artificial intelligence that is out there now is we often refer to as being narrow or weak. And, and of course, the goal is moving toward a more general uh, AI, which I understand to be you know, a much broader, mm. deeper application of this technology. So how close are we to having a general AI environment and maybe something where these, these systems actually can outthink or outperform we uh, poor pathetic humans? I mean, the short answer is we don't know, right? It, it, we don't know when we'll get there, and I don't know you mentioned that that's the end goal. I don't know that it is the end goal, right? Right now we have narrow systems that are narrowly quite good at the tasks that they are narrowly doing. Um, there isn't a reason for the artificial intelligence systems that we are using now to be more generally intelligent. It just means that you could theoretically apply artificial intelligence to a broader swath of use cases. Um, that could potentially be very useful. Uh, I don't think that anyone can reliably say when we will get there. There's a lot of people that have fun in predicting whether or not that will be positive and when and how we will get there. Uh, I think the important thing uh, for you all in the policy space is to make sure that whatever uh, is being considered uh, for legislation, for regulation, is focused on mitigating you know, actual issues that your constituencies are facing or could theoretically be facing uh, based on you know, truly scientific evidence of where this technology is going. If we're basing regulation and legislation on a hypothetical end in which systems are highly intelligent, potentially comparable to humans, we are operating in such a philosophical and hypothetical space that we're never going to inform good policy. Mm. Yeah, this this comes up. I say that a lot. This in this panel, this comes up a lot. This idea it does of, come up a lot. Yeah, I think we had somebody talk about it to us just before the panel started. This idea of um, AGI versus um, NAR AI. I don't think anybody can claim to have a direct path from here towards artificial general intelligence. I think it's what lots of us researchers are looking forward to. Maybe out of perverse glee, but it's something we, we, we think is interesting. But we don't know how, we do, how it will come about. Um, from a policy uh, regulatory perspective, it's interesting to note that 
historically, at least in the recent history of AI policy, which is a new space, AI policy, much of the discourse has been driven by existential risks conversations with due to artificial general intelligence. And even if I don't necessarily believe that is a thing now or in the near future, it has done a lot to raise the profile of AI concerns, and I'm grateful for that. It means that legislators are thinking more carefully about AI policy. Um, the population is thinking more carefully about AI policy. That's a good thing. Um, trying to determine legislation and regulation on the basis of AI, AGI concern, I probably think is less principled. I don't think there is a good argument to be made for it. And if you want to, I, I, my perspective so far, based on a couple of years thinking about this, is if you want to mitigate long-term AGI concerns, AI safety concerns, working on near-term AI safety concerns are as, at least as good at mitigating those far-term concerns. Because let's think about it. Many of the AI safety concerns, they are about some inscrutable Terminator AI destroying the world because it decides it wants, it wants to achieve some goal. Things like making sure that AI systems are validated and verified. That's a near-term concern. Things like making sure that AI systems are aligned with human values. That's not a future concern. That's a near-term concern. That's a biased concern, trying to make AI more equitable. That's a value alignment concern. This issue of forcing them to explain their decisions, both near-term AI and far-term AI will benefit from being able to explain to users why it's making a particular decision. So the, the dichotomy is not as useful for, for regulation, for legislation. It does help get, get more traction in the population uh, in, in higher spaces. So I have to say, as, uh, as someone who covered Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger closely for seven years, the mentions of the Terminator are always, uh, it's hard for me to not hear the governator in my head uh, when we talk about that. Uh, I don't want to hog the microphone all day. If anyone has questions, uh, there's a microphone here in the middle of the room. If you want to position yourself there, I will see you. I will call on you. Uh, I'm going I'm to keep going unless somebody steps up there. So please don't be shy. Feel free to step up uh, while you have access to these brilliant minds uh, next to me. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, the governor slash terminator. Oh, can I add a point on the AGI concern? Oh, please do. Uh, so, people argue that the path between here and the future AGI is this issue of transfer learning. So, transfer learning is this idea that you take a narrow AI system and it's able to perform well on other tasks and improving the capacity of transferring expertise on one task to other task tasks will improve, will basically provide a path towards artificial general intelligence. There's been a, lo a lot of work in the past two, three years on transfer learning. It's actually a viable, it's looking more and more viable as, as the months go by. So maybe it's not so, uh, um, it, it's not so unexpected, it's not so far away. Well, that, yeah, see, that's brilliant. You read my mind because that leads into the next question because um, as I said, I mentioned you know, the, the, the Terminator. And I think so many people, when you think of artificial intelligence, they probably do get this image of you know, Arnold in, in, in any of the Terminator movies. And I, it's probably a big driver of a lot of our myths and maybe misconceptions mm -hmm. about artificial intelligence. Uh, what are the biggest, aside from you know, we're gonna have an army of cyborgs coming mm -hmm. to, to wipe out the human race, what are the, the biggest myths and misconceptions that you see right now about the artificial intelligence technology that we're dealing with? I mean, I think that you highlighted one of the most important ones, which is that a lot of these fears seem to be influenced by people's perception of machines and movies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's created excitement around the technology, but it's also created like really weird, unfounded concerns mm -hmm. about the technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so just as a general basis, I'm pleased that the notion of artificial intelligence and its future applications have kind of created this resurgence of interest in philosophy, right? People are a lot more interested in thinking about very big picture societal questions and how a new force could influence that. Those are great discussions. That's important stuff to talk about. It was very central to the whole way that Emmanuel Macron portrayed France's uh, approach to AI was making sure 
that it fit within their view of society. And I think it's important for other societies to think about how AI fits within their viewpoint of mm -hmm. the future of society. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's super productive to think about how a Hollywood movie that portrays sentient machines fits into your viewpoint of future society. But think about it if you want to. I, I, I like the point about um, the, the, the focus on artificial intelligence, resur uh, causing a resurgence in, the, in philosophical thought. It's actually one of the things that comes up over and over in my work. I find myself reading philosophers because they help me inform what I'm thinking about for a particular thing. So thinking about having AI explain itself, it's a question of how do you know you know what you know, essentially epistemology. Uh, thinking about, okay, what is fair, what is equitable, what is bias in an algorithmic system. That's a question of ethics, and trying to answer it as just, a, with just an engineering mindset is probably not, is not very useful. Um, in, terms of, ooh, in terms of misconceptions or, or what the po popular misconceptions, I, I would say this may not be the most the most salient misconception, but I'll harp on it because it's important and it, it drives a lot, of, a lot of the pathologies we see in the use of algorithms for decision making, is this issue of um, automation bias, this issue of um, this assumption of infallibility in algorithmic systems. Algorithms are consistent. That's what they're designed to do. Consistency is not the same thing as objectivity. Uh, that is something that recurs over and over again. The context of a decision determines what is allowable, what is acceptable. Just having a consistent decision maker doesn't mean it's best for that context. With your mention of the, of going back to philosophy to look at sort of these issues, I, I guess, are there other ethical issues to consider more than just the issues of equity and the privacy and the bias issues that you raised mm -hmm. that legislators need to consider or policymakers oh. in general? Yeah, certainly. This this might be so. One of my students is working on 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 the the implications of algorithms for the future of work, and this this question recurs. What is? It's not quite a philosophical question. It's maybe it maybe goes back to Max Weber's discussion about work ethic. What is the value of work? Why is it important? Do we really? If we if we end up in a situation where artificial intelligence, because it improves efficiencies, leads to a post scarcity society, would we still enforce? this work ethic, is that necessary? Which is part of the reason why I started thinking less about assuring jobs and work in the future and more about assuring the welfare of the people. And if, if because I don't necessarily think that jobs are, are a stable unit of welfare. <laughs> and the flip side of that is that many people may view jobs as a stable unit of welfare, whether or not that is the you know, philosophically ideal way to approach it is the societally practical way in which many people think. Yeah. Um, and so the, that argument has a complete yeah. opposite side, yeah. and I don't know which one wins, but certainly discussions of the fact that we might need universal basic income in the next five years, uh, I think are just a colossal leap from mm -hmm. where technologically and probably societally from a total welfare standpoint, people actually would want to be. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other concerns that need to be thought about, I mean, certainly, I mean, nothing's off limits. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the use and, and deployment of some of these very potent technologies, particularly in surveillance settings, mm -hmm. uh, are something that societies need to philosophically think about as to what is the one appropriate level of surveillance versus mitigation of harms that mm -hmm. you're willing to tolerate. And, and two, to what degree are we willing to accept the use of a technology like artificial intelligence uh, to be applied in that type of setting, uh, and whether the trade-off between harm mitigation versus privacy intrusion is appropriate for whatever society is thinking about going down that road. Yeah. And, and this is interesting because also it brings up this issue of pluralism. What is acceptable in China is, probably, is different from what's acceptable in, in the EU, is different from what's acceptable in Africa, and from what's acceptable in the US. And if you're living in a society where we have artificial intelligence deployed across the globe, what set of values gets to dominate, gets to control the artificial intelligence deployment? It's not quite clear we've, we've thought that far ahead, and I don't know what, what, what's gonna happen long term. Well, once again, you, you've led right into the question that I was going to ask, because I think um, 
right now, I mean, one of one of the, one of our, our real issues in, in all levels of law or, uh, le of uh, lawmaking and legislation and governance is, uh, you know, we seem to have sometimes very different viewpoints on things than the EU does or China does or what have you. What are some of the approaches that we're seeing in other nations to this technology, how it's implemented, how it's being used, how it's being regulated, that are different than what we're doing and maybe uh, impacting in some way what we're doing with it? I think that what you brought up, each society is and should approach the use of artificial intelligence in a societally appropriate manner. So we're not going to be China in our deployment of AI. We're not going to create a level of government-based surveillance using artificial intelligence the way that they are. Our society wouldn't tolerate it. At the same time, we're not going to be Europe in our level of personal data ownership to an extreme, right? I think that the US sits at a relative sweet spot in our approach to technology security data, et cetera, um, it's played out in the fact that we have held the dominant position in technology creation, technology commercialization globally, um, truly for you know, the, the foreseeable past. Mm -hmm. um, I don't anticipate, I hope we don't see a radical departure from that approach. I think that we can continue to see a reasonable balance between leadership and technology and uh, understanding of the fact that we're moving toward more data-heavy technologies that are going to require conversations about data transparency and data ownership and data control that does not necessitate a GDPR US, but it does necessitate a conversation about what the appropriate level of regulation in that space is. And I think we can reach a prudent level uh, here that balances leadership and technology and personal confidence in that technology. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, US, the, United, the United States con context is different. In fact, many of the 51 states have different contexts in how they, they think of technology. California and many states on, in the South and probably don't agree very much. Uh, I think one, one of the, one of the b besides the commercial aspects of, of the use of technology is, is the defense aspect and the differences in the different regimes they have long-term consequences. Uh, I think it's hard to argue that the U.S. will remain, will remain, will have such a gap between itself and the second, the second most technologically advanced country. We are probably going to live more in a more multipolar world, and so the choices other countries, other domains make affect our choices in interesting ways. So um, the use of one of the one of the interesting discussions over the last year has been the use of lethal autom autonomous weapons. What the United States chooses to do in that space will affect what China chooses to do in its own space, and will affect what Russia chooses to do. And so, there's going to have to be this multipolar view in terms of technology technology policy, and I don't know how what mechanisms exist for that quite yet. It, you know, um, we're in such a polarized political environment in this day and age, and I don't want to make this a political question because that's not a, necessarily a political panel, but clearly when we have situations where, you know, uh, some lawmakers in some states can't travel to other states because of, you know, political decisions that have been made, policies that have been adopted, et cetera, et cetera. Technology crosses every border everywhere all the time. Mm notwithstanding China blocking Google or what have you, I mean, we still see it. It doesn't matter where you're at. Technology is going to get access somehow, some way. So it does make me, you know, wonder with all of this polarization, uh, what role maybe this kind of technology plays uh, or, or how it will advance or not advance uh, based on these political things. Can it... Can politicians screw it up, I guess, is the short version of this question, or is it going to march on regardless? They can do things to hamper their nation's ability to lead in this space. I mean, the technology is moving forward. It's a matter of whether you want to reap the benefits of the technology moving forward. And I'll just throw out one policy uh, that I think has significant implication here, and that's immigration. 
right? If we are going to go down a path in which we are making it more difficult for immigrant entrepreneurs to come to the U.S., we're making it more difficult for companies, whether in technology or not, uh, to hire people from other nations that went to school here or that got educated at you know, institutions elsewhere in the globe, but particularly individuals that went to some of our best institutions here. If we're going to adopt a policy of sending those people home to work for competitive companies in foreign nations, we are shooting ourselves in the foot, right? If you want to be a leader in technology, you want a immigration program that helps facilitate getting the minds here that you need. Um, you look at the way that foreign countries are approaching this, whether it's EU countries, whether it's Australia, whether it's Canada, they are making active and concerted efforts to recruit people that fill holes in their economy. Mm -hmm. We are not doing that, uh, and it is to our detriment. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so uh, back in grad school, uh, anecdotally, all the engineering classes were 90% immigrant and many of them would leave after they, were, they got their degree and went go back home to apply their expertise to other countries' um, um, economies. Um, <clears throat> it's it's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's going to be a huge problem. Although I, I want to point out, poke a hole, technology is marching forward and it, it finds a way to get in every nook and cranny of the world, but data does not, at least by regulatory standards, um, data, increasingly we are seeing what we call um, data silos or data blind spots. Um, many companies in the United States have limited access to data in China. Uh, many companies in the United States have limited access to data in, say, Russia. And so this has implications for what types of AI deployment you can create. If you're trying to create something that caters to a Chinese audience, that's hard to do. And I also pointed out earlier this, this issue of um, filter bubbles. So even if data is everywhere, let's say we're in the United States where data flows freely, supposedly, people can still find their way through the use of algorithms into data, data silos, where they only access information that's accessible to a certain subnetwork. So in a sense, it's a brave new world, but it's still, there's still fences between people, between people and countries. So we only have a few minutes left, so I want to ask uh, kind of a final question here. And you've, you've answered this to various degrees already, but I'm going to ask you maybe to put a little bow on it here. Uh, what do you see as the most important role that state legislatures, governors, state lawmakers can play in regard to artificial intelligence, the, adva the advancement of artificial intelligence, intelligence, <laughs> easy for me to say, in, uh, in, to the greatest benefit of their constituents. What, what is this role that state legislatures and governors and lawmakers should be playing? Education and testing, mm -hmm. right? Those are where I view your niche that the federal government cannot, even if they desire to, to the greatest extent, fully address. You have much more local control over education, partnerships with industry and collaboration on co-developing curriculums, Whatever it might be, you have control over that. Uh, on the testing side of things, again, this is a way to differentiate yourself from other states, um, from other nations. If you embrace the ability to test autonomous vehicles, test drone technologies, test other cutting edge technologies, you will help build an ecosystem in your state that will then reap benefits for years when you develop an industry around some of those testing regimes. I would say, along the same lines, be proactive in regulation. And I don't mean negative regulation. I don't mean hammer down anybody who is innovative. I mean, give, many, many tech companies are looking for, for more clarity in what's allowable within, their state, within a state. Having some, a form of dialogue in which you can actually foster innovation in a clear way is a good thing. And you can do that without necessarily being anti-innovation, without necessarily um, stabbing them every time they try something new. Uh, I would also say um, you need to be able to attract talent. Yeah. Talent attracts talent. If you create an ecosystem of people who have AI expertise within your state, you ju you'll just keep growing. Once you create crit critical mass, that increases the economic capacity of the state. That's a huge thing, I think. 
Oh, sure, please do. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm a California lawmaker, so technology is something that we, of course, interact with a lot. Um, you were talking about the fears for tech from technology or AI. So I'm not afraid of the autonomous killing robots at this point, but I'll tell you what I am afraid of. I'm afraid when I hear about baby monitors mm. being having absolutely no security that are connected to the internet and hackable. Mm. I'm concerned when I hear about television sets spying on consumers. I'm concerned when I hear about social media sites that knowingly sell advertisements to foreign governments to interfere with elections or that have algorithms that create divisions and silos that enrage people and give a slanted view of what our country of, of the of you know issues between people in in communities um, these are things that concern me greatly and you talk about regulation oh and also technologies that on a weekly basis I learn about that seem to be designed to circumvent laws for other industries that well, that operate in the same space but not delivering their services in the same way taking advantage of the technology to skirt different sorts of regulations um, or taxes or whatever you call it so I see an industry that has great potential and is powering the economy of my state, but seems to operate with the idea that they're outside of any normal ethics, um, unconcerned with issues that concern my constituents greatly. So I can never create regulations that are going to deal with every one of these issues, because it seems like they pop up in different sectors constantly. But maybe what we need is the industry to sit down with lawmakers and come up with some kind of an ethics code to operate under, because from my perspective, you have strayed beyond uh, as an industry, what I would consider to be ethical behavior. Hmm. So just wanted to put that out there and see if you have any comments. I, I think it speaks to the fact, uh, as I mentioned, that we do have uh, a resurgence in society of discussions around the ethical uh, and moral application of technologies and how they fit within our idea of what we want our society to be. Um, you brought up a number of different specific instances, and you would certainly be happy to chat with you after about some details of each of those. Um, when we talk about, let's just take data security, though, when you talk about hackable devices, um, that's something that, as I mentioned, for our companies, they consider it bad business practice, right? If you're selling something that can be hacked and cause the consumer distress or harm, that is not the way that you are ever going to sell them a product again in the future. What we do unfortunately see is that sometimes new entrants to the market that are coming from outside the US aren't and are trying to get an edge with a low cost in um, aren't taking those same precautions. And so you'll see one or two unscrupulous new entrants to the market that create something that would never meet the standards more broadly that our companies would put forth. Um, and then you get a report and you get consumer fear mm -hmm. um, based off of one or two companies that truly aren't doing the right thing. Um, and we as an industry want to take it upon ourselves to make sure that our companies are um, enforcing and implementing uh, the strongest type, in this case, uh, of data security requirements, um, and also raising awareness about the fact that their brands are doing this, right? So as a consumer, you know, look, like I'm buying this device. They're going to make sure that they have good protocols in place. Uh, and then maybe you would raise some questions about a company that you'd never heard of and showed up for a really cheap price on an online retailer. You, maybe you rightfully would have some questions as to what kind of security protocols were involved in that device. Excellent point. I, I love everything you brought up. Um, the issue of privacy seems to be a, a, a foundational point for you. And it's a, it's a hard problem. And in the United States, we, we haven't had a, a strong a strong tradition of clear privacy laws in a way that is enforceable across the board. Um, that is something we can work on as in, through regulation. I don't know if state regulation is the way to go. I'm not sure. Um, th this issue of ethics in, in algorithms, it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge sticking point. Um, recently, we've been working very carefully, essentially trying to do, do a version of applied ethics for AI systems. And I can say that a lot of people, even the, the, the major digital natives up in Silicon Valley, they are, they are contributing significantly to this effort, trying to become, to, to satisfy what the population thinks is ethical. Uh, it's not easy 
And if, if, if it seems like they've been evading, it's because it's easier to evade sometimes than to do. But they, there is a lot of, there's a lot of efforts trying to make things better. I don't know if, I, I, I'm not trying to allay your fears, I'm just pointing out that there is work being done. Were there any other questions? Oh, please do. Um, so I work in the legislature in Oregon. I'm also I'm chief of staff for a representative, and I also do comparative policy cybersecurity research. And so I, I'm that one, that weird person that can do the education on both sides, the, the policy side and the tech side. And what we've seen in the U.S. is that historically we are incredibly uh, reactive to any sort of science and technology regulation or understanding. And I think that there is this gap between what to regulate and the nuance of, of what stifles innovation and what does not, mm -hmm. um, as well as what lends to safety and what is just kind of uh, lip service. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm looking into this area of where we can not only have these, these education pushes because I and very familiar with the not only the age of the the average age of the legislature, but also this fear that you say that oh it's the Terminator and that's what they're scared of. But really, at, we're pushing all of this automation and and trying to get people into CTE and STEM fields. But at the same time, the things that can't be automated are going to be what's important in the next you know industrial revolution. If you want to talk mm -hmm. about it in that term, and the things like critical thinking, problem solving, mm -hmm. and and those sorts of things are also educational priorities because that, those are things we can't automate yet. But as you said, this, the, the speed of the legislature is very slow and linear. Mm. And now we're seeing the rate of change is not linear, it is exponential. And as we create machines that can learn to create other machines that learn, we will see that curve sharply increase to the point where we cannot possibly keep up as legislatures. And so I'm wondering if you are working in any areas to create legislative structures or uh, legal support systems, you look at things like contract law that could be easily automated in the near future, and how are we going to implement these mechanisms to help not only educate at the rate of change, but also prepare and address when, when mm. historically all we've done is 100% reactive. Mm. Well, I'd certainly be happy to come out anytime. I grew up in Corvallis and worked for Peter DeFazio in DC for five years. So oh, I, great. Yeah, we're uh, East Portland, but yeah. I, I, you actually, you've got a great resource there. Um, and uh, Suzanne Bonamici, uh, yeah. is, she's really thinking through, like frankly, more than most other um, elected officials at the federal level, thinking through what future education looks like to prepare people for not just the careers of the future, but the creative thinking of the future. Um, mm. So you happen to have one of the best resources right there. Interesting. Mm. Um, so I would certainly uh, engage her and talk to her about the ways that she's been working with local education institutions and companies. Um, and she's got some pretty interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, certainly happy to, to discuss further. And you, we mentioned there are a lot of opportunities to, to educate people at, at a state level and have a deeper connection between local companies uh, and you know, people that have the ability to legislate and regulate in these spaces. So it's something that taking away from your suggestion uh, and this discussion I'll be thinking about as to how practically we can help facilitate that. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, it's a heavy lift for having 50 states, uh, but it's something that's important to do, and I want to think about creative ways that we can help make sure that people like you can tap into the resources that you want to tap into. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the Rand Corporation is a public policy think tank focused on the public interest. S sorry, I, sometimes I have to say that because I f sometimes people don't know. Not develop. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, one of the things I've, I've 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 been trying to do is try to create projects and reports, public reports that inform not just the, the lay person but also um, decision makers at high levels about the the problems with algorithms. Essentially, informing them how better to think about algorithms and AI going forward. And I, I'm happy to say that. Uh, we've been getting some some traction. People are understanding more and more about what algorithms are, and they're using that to inform their decision making. Um, also, we are recently, one of the things we are, we are trying to go beyond just educating, we're also trying to go to the stage where we're giving decision makers, policy makers, legislators frameworks for thinking about, okay, you have this institution in which you're using, you have a decision pipeline of, a pipeline of decisions, some of which will be replaced by algorithms. What types of systemic problems arise from those types of deployments? And increasingly, we are getting better at, at informing and creating frameworks for that. 
And in, in terms of, so the, the question you brought, the issue you brought up about this um, differential time, um, um, time scale for development and regulation is one thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's as old as science technology policy and one of the, thing, the lines of thinking that has, been, that has been resonating with me recently is this idea of adaptive regulation where instead of just creating one-time laws based on limited information, you're adapting with, in response to data, new information in the field about that particular piece of technology. And another thing that's been interesting, that's probably less high-tech, less, less, less theoretical, is this idea of sunset clauses on, on laws that are related to, to science technology policy. Because if, if eventually you're always most, regulations related to science technology policy are going to get things wrong in one way, shape, or the other. And forcing our continuous reassessment every, say, two years, five years, that type of stuff is extremely important. I'm thinking right now about things like HIPAA. They talk about the, HIPAA is the health health privacy law. I forget the full, the full details of the acronym. They, they refer to these things called personally identifiable information, as in these types of data that are so sensitive that it must not be disclosed in health, health applications. And increasingly, we are finding that there is no such thing as PII. Every piece of information is personally identifiable if you have enough of it. And so you, this is an example of a law that was created at a time when AI was still, in, was still nascent and is increasingly becoming more and more obsolete. Having some type of revision, review of these types of laws, sunset clauses, might help. Uh, I'm still thinking through it. We're always still thinking through it. So. With that, we do have to wrap it up because we're over time, but Heather has a question for you. Well, based on the discussion that we've had and we've heard, I wanted to ask the poll question again to see if um, who is looking still forward to artificial intelligence and who's looking forward to it with trepidation. Just by a show of hands, has your position changed after hearing this discussion? <laughs> Or maybe it's still with the same amount of trepidation. <laughs> I think we have a bit of selection bias. The people who stay. <laughs> That's true. Right. Good point. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Well, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists today. And I know I saw that it looks like there may have been a couple other questions. So if our speakers are still available and want to stay after t to help answer some of those questions for you. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming today. Yes, thank you.